Man, all right, I'm going to make a couple of opening remarks which are completely and totally unrelated to the sermon. I was thinking about saying something about it while we were singing the song about He is so precious to me. And I decided not to when I walked up here. But then while Brother Russ was reading, something jumped out at me, which I've noticed this before, but in this context, it jumped out at me along those same exact lines. I want you to look in Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2, look at verse number 13. Again, again, it says this, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I preached about the subject of, of proving that the Lord Jesus Christ is God and that there's one only true God. And this was, this was our, our primary text, our opening text. It's extremely obvious that it's telling you that it's the appearing of the, our glorious God and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's one person. God is one person. And then it says this, verse 14, who gave himself for us. And the remark that I was going to make was when we were singing that song about he is so precious to me, when I came to the realization and the, and, the, and the deeper understanding about who God was, and I understood that like all the fullness, you know, like I said that before, but then I got like really that it was all the fullness of the God had dwelled in him bodily. And I understood that God is one person with one mind. It's just him. And that that true one God, him, he was the one who gave himself for me. He became that much more precious to me. The name of Jesus became that much more precious to me. And I just loved him and was so much more thankful to him for what he had done. That he didn't, he didn't have to, you know, he didn't have, it wasn't a board or a panel of three people and one person decided to send the other person. That was, you know, I had kind of a, an understanding like that to a degree. You know, where, where there was a plan that was drawn up and, you know, they drew straws kind of. Not exactly, obviously, right? But the first person had the plan. And he said, hey, second person, you're going. But no, what it was, was the only person said, I got a plan and I'm going. Right. So that makes him so much more precious when you understand that biblical God had matters and you could praise him and worship him in a much deeper way. And when you, and when you say the name of Jesus Christ, you can give him even more glory and honor when you have that, that true understanding of who God is and that it is just one person. He gave himself for us. Amen. Amen. All right, look here at Titus chapter number 2. We're in our series, Obeying Authority. This is going to be part 3. And the title tonight is Being a Good Employee. I'm going to be talking about obeying your masters at work. Being a good employee. Look with me here at Titus chapter number 2. Verse number 9, the Bible says this, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Verse number 10, Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So as I said, I'm going to be giving principles from the Bible and teaching about obeying your boss, obeying your masters at work. Now, many people can learn from this. I know some people, you know, I know Brother Anthony and, and Brother Russell, they have their own job they are their own company, but Brother Anthony is working a job as well. You know, Brother, Brother Hall has, you know, a, a, a job that he works for a boss. He has bosses. Brother Rick does as well, but it doesn't matter what situation you're in, you can learn from this. Even the, the women can learn from this because they have a boss, their husband. You know, if you own a company, you can learn from this because you're working for someone, the client, right? Now, of of course, the relationship isn't exactly the same, but it's similar. Most people have or will be in a position somewhere where they're working for someone. And of course, a lot of the same principles are going to be exactly the same when you're obeying authority. But this is an area where people, it seems, struggle the most. Where people, it seems like they don't actually understand to what degree they are to be in subjection to their bosses at work and when they are working for their employer. There's a lot of strong language about servants being in subjection and obeying their bosses. Let me start off with just that simple statement, and that is going to be point number one. You need to obey your boss at work. You need to obey your boss at work. And you are the servant, and he is the master. Now, he's our master according to the flesh. I'm going to get into that as well. Look at verse number nine one more time. Notice the strong language. It says this. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. And then look at this. And to please them well in all things, not answering again. So notice that they are to exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. And then it goes even further and says, and to please them well in all things. <clears throat> so you should be obedient 
to your boss at work. Now there's different levels of management, right? There's upper management, there's lower management. You should be obedient to all of them. If they have a legitimate authority that has been given from the company to them and they are over you within that company, you need to obey them. You are a servant and you need to obey them and you need to be obedient unto their request. And not only that, you need to please them. You need, when they, when they have a job for you and they have work for you to do, you need to try to please them well. Whatever task that they assign to you, whatever project that they give to you, whatever job that they, uh, you know, ascribe to you, you need to try to obey them. You need to obey them and you need to please them well, it says, in all things. And then notice the next statement as well. Again, look at that. Not answering again. You know what that means? Not talking back. When they tell you to do something, just do it. Don't, don't give them your idea. Don't tell them why you think that you can do it a better way or, hey, I used to work for this other company and this was the way that we used to do it there. I'll tell you, I was a project manager and that's the last thing that I like to hear. And I would always tell people, well, hey, you work for this company and this is the way that we do it here. So, you know, even if you work for someone else and, uh, and, and let's say that, you know, you were taught something a better way. Right? There's nothing wrong with maybe showing that, that, that boss how you guys did it. Right? But you know what you need to do? You need to do it his way first and then maybe find a better time later to bring it up to him. That's what you need to do. You need to go along with how he wants it done and don't try to stop and say, hey, well, I was just thinking maybe we should do it this way. Go ahead and be obedient to him. Do it exactly how he wants it and find an opportunity later to say, hey, I, I don't know if you'd be interested in this or not. And, and of course, be respectful. He is your boss. Be in subjection to him and say, hey, you know, I had this idea. You know what? He may, be, he may not receive it. And if he doesn't, no answering again. Don't talk back to him. Just say, yes, sir. And walk away. If, maybe he will. Maybe he'll say, hey, you know, that's a good idea. We're going to implement that now. But when you're given a job or a task from your boss, don't talk back. That's what that means. Not answering again. You need to just be obedient and you need to do it. I want you to go to uh, Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 5. Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 5. We're going to see this here over and over again in um, Paul's epistles. He gives a lot of commandments on this particular subject. So that's Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 5. I'm going to read to you from Colossians chapter number 4, verse number 1. It says this... <clears throat> Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. And then it says, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Now here in verse number 1 of Colossians chapter 4, notice that it says, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. A lot of times people misunderstand what a master is and what a servant is, especially here in the New Testament when we're reading this. The master is just the boss. It's just another word for a boss. It doesn't mean that the servant's a slave and the master is the master of the slave. It's just saying boss. It's just like the word Lord. We wouldn't use it often. We wouldn't use it today how it used to be used and how we see it used in the Bible, right? We see it in some context, you know, like landlord, right? But it's another word for just a boss. That's all that master means. And to prove that these aren't slaves, notice it says, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. Is this guy a slave? No, he's being, he's being recompensed, you know, with, with equity. He's being given, you know, equality when it comes to his pay. He's not working for nothing. He's not being beaten and then just given rations, right? This is a guy that's being, you know, treated well and he's being paid that which is just and equal. So when we see masters and servants brought up in the Bible, you can go to Colossians chapter 4 verse 1 and we can clarify that this is talking about an employer and an employee, a boss and then a servant or a worker. <clears throat> I want you to go over to uh, Ephesians chapter number 6. You should already be there. Ephesians 6. Look with me at verse number 5 now. It says this, servants be obedient. So notice again, the worker, the, employ the employee is supposed to be obedient. We see this word over and over again. Servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Remember we have, you know, Christ is, our, is, our, is the only one we're supposed to call master. That's spiritually. Notice here it says, Master according to the flesh, right? So this is just your boss according to the flesh. That's what that means. Notice what it says next, with fear and trembling. Notice that, with fear and trembling, right? Because they have a legitimate authority over you. There's a, there's a real reason to fear, right? There's a real reason to fear your boss. You know, having a good job is important. It should mean something to you. And if you're a man of character, it does mean something to you. And you desire to excel when it comes to those areas of life. 
And the, the power that they hold in their hand is just to terminate you at any moment and to, and to send you home. That's a lot of power. You, you know, there's reasons that you should be obedient with fear and trembling. You know, the Bible teaches this across the board of all authorities, that there should be a fear of authority. We should have a legitimate fear of authority because there's power there. That's the reason why. If there's power there, then there's a reason to fear. It says, with fear and tremble, trembling, and then it says this, in singleness of heart. And then it says, as unto Christ. The singleness of heart is talking about uh, uh, unity. It's talking about sincerity. It's saying you're not double-minded. Right? Not like you're saying one thing and doing something else. In singleness of heart, that you're actually being obedient from the heart. That's what it's referring to. It goes further and actually explains that. Look at verse number 6. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So explain what he means by singleness of heart, that you're actually being obedient from the heart. It's sincerity, right? He goes and says there in verse number 6, not with eye service as men pleasers. What does that mean? That's saying that you're just doing it for them to see. You're, you know, just, just for their eyes, right? Not with eye service as men pleasers. That you're ju just when someone's around, maybe you're being obedient, right? Just while they're there and, you're watch and they're watching you, you're being obedient. But this actually goes further than that. This is actually talking about that you're being obedient from the heart. Right? In singleness of heart, like you're serving Christ, but as, servants, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So it shouldn't only be just for eye service, even while they look at you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Even just because they're there, and they're watching you, and they're looking at you, and they can see you doing it, that's still not enough. This is actually saying that you should be doing the will of God from your heart. Even when, you're look, even when they're looking at you, it shouldn't just... Whatever they see, it should be singleness of heart. The same thing should be in your heart. That's what that means. You should be serving them from your heart. You should be in your heart being obedient unto them and desiring to uh, please them, right? To be well-pleasing to them, right? Look at verse 7. With good will doing service... As to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening. Knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So the idea of understanding and knowing that God is going to repay us for every amount of work that we ever do, that alone should compel you. That should be an incentive, right? That should be a motive that even if you have a dirty, bad task at your job, even if you've been given some work that you don't want to do or that you don't enjoy doing, God will pay you back for that. Amen. God is going to pay you for whatever, whatever work that it is. God is just and God is equal. If, even if they don't, be just and equal with you, guess what? God will be just and equal. And you will someday receive from Him. That's why we need to make sure that you're not only just going through the motions while you're there, while you're, you know, you're bitter in your heart, you're angry with your boss, but he can't see that. It looks and appears like you love him, like you're doing a good job for him, like you're in, you're, you're in obedience to him, and you're doing all the work that he wants. Because why? That might damage your reward for Christ. Because Christ actually sees the heart. And Christ can actually see whether you're doing it in singleness of heart and with the right heart and in sincerity. So that's why it's important to make sure that you have the right attitude when you're serving your boss or your master at work. Colossians chapter number 3 verse number 22 says something very similar. It's really a parallel passage. The whole chapter is... Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. So we should obey our masters and obey our bosses because we fear the Lord, because we are serving God when we serve our boss. Our God, the Lord, wants us to have a job. He wants us to work. That is a big part of why God put us here. If you go all the way back to the book of Genesis... <clears throat> He created Adam and Eve, and what did he do immediately? I want you to go dress this garden. He put them there to do work. That was the purpose of it. When the, you know, so in that, that's paradise. That's when they're being blessed and they're in paradise. Then the earth is cursed, and guess what he does? Now I want you to go plow the ground. Now I want you to go work out there. So notice that when they're in paradise, what are they doing? Working. When the earth is cursed, it's no longer paradise. Guess what they're doing? Guess what God's will is for man to do? Work. 
Work. God wants us to work. We should enjoy working. We should not, you know, hate going to work or doing things like that. We should have the right attitude and the right heart about work and enjoy it because that is what life is about. It's about work. Amen. I want you to go with me to 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 18. 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 18. So number one starts off, you need to obey your boss. Now this would be so radical. It's, it, it sounds radical to a lot of, you know, of, of the millennials, if you will. A lot of people that are looking for a job today, that probably at your company, maybe you know, uh, uh, your, your pupils or, or, or fellow workers, right? A lot of them, if you use the words like, hey, we should obey our boss, they probably think like, you are crazy, right? You know, you're crazy. That type of language especially, that, would, that sounds radical, I'm sure, to people. They feel like they have, you know, some leverage to push them around. That's not how it works. They're your boss. You're the servant. They're the master. That should be the relationship. Um, Colossians 3.22, you may or may not have noticed this, but it said, Servants, obey in all things your masters. Obey in all things your masters. Right? And I'm going to get to that. There's a caveat, of course, with the Lord when He enters into the equation. Right? Uh, but you need to obey in all things. You need to obey everything that they tell you to do. You need to be obeying your masters. <clears throat> you are in 1 Peter chapter number 2. Let me get there myself. 1 Peter chapter number 2. So the point so far were you need to obey your boss. You need to obey your boss. You need to, and then you need, to, you need to obey your boss because you are obeying God by doing so. You need to obey your boss because you are obeying God by doing so. Point number 3 was you need to obey from the heart. You need to obey from the heart. <clears throat> when you're obeying you know, your boss, one of the major ways to do that and to show that is by referring to him as sir. I think strongly that you need to you know, show through your speech that you are being obedient. And when I'm talking to my bosses, I say sir to them every time I respond. Whether it's text, whether, it, whether it's verbal and in person, I say sir. Yes sir, no sir. Not only do I do that with my managers, but I am in a, a mid-level position of authority. I'm a foreman, like an on-site supervisor. And I will sometimes be on other people's job sites. So I have a job site that I'm running over off of Kingsley. When I'm not there, and I'm at someone else's job site, I'm not the foreman. I'm not the boss. There's another guy on site that's the boss. And most of the time, I'm not on someone else's site. But guess what I do when I'm there? Yes, sir, no, sir. I walk in and I ask him, what would you like me to do? And he'll tell me and he'll assign me a task. I don't go in there and try to assign him, you know, what he thinks. I think, hey, this guy's better doing this job. You know, and you know, you know, I've worked with him, so you need to do this. I don't give them advice. I don't tell them how to do their job because I have no authority in this case. All of my authority has been eliminated when I stepped off my job site and was put on his. So you need to be able to, in those kind of situations, you need to be able to be in subjection to your boss, whether it's mid-level, whether it's you know, uh, uh, upper management, whatever it is. And a way to show that is through your speech. A way to show that is, telling, is speaking to them in a respectful way. I strongly suggest that you should say, yes sir, no sir, refer to them as, you know, sir, when you get the opportunity to speak to them and be respectful to them and show them that you honor their position of authority and that you are honoring them and obeying them. 1 Peter chapter number 2, 1 Peter chapter number 2, the fourth point is obey your bad bosses too. Even if you have a boss that's a wicked person, a froward man, you need to obey him too. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 2 verse number 18. It says this, "Servants be in be sub, I'm sorry, servants be subject to your masters with all fear." Notice the word fear again. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. A perfect definition of the word froward is perverse. Now, perverse is not talking about like a pervert. Perverse is just saying that he has things backwards, right? It's just saying a wicked person. He's not a, he's not a righteous man. He's an unjust man. You know, and quite frankly, the majority of people today in the United States of America, our culture is not a very righteous, clean culture. Most bosses that you probably had in your life probably have a filthy mouth, don't they? They probably talk about dirty, disgusting things oftentimes. You know, they'll want to tell you, you know, maybe not do it out loud or anything, but they'll want to make dirty statements and, and stuff like that. Obviously, take no part in that at all, period. Have no part in that. Stay away from all of that wickedness. But when he gives you an order, because he's an unjust, you know, froward man, that makes no difference. You still obey his authority. You still be in subjection to him because he's not saved. It's not like, oh, my boss ain't saved. I'm just going to do whatever I want. 
Oh, he's not a child of God. Oh, he lives a wicked life. You know, I don't have to obey him. That's not, why, that's not how it works. And you actually, you can see why someone could develop an attitude like this and start as a saved person to look down upon them, couldn't you? And to kind of, you know, take their authority lightly. Well, that's why God makes sure to explain that, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Oftentimes, you'll have bosses that are mean. You know, you'll have some bosses that are, that are, that are kind of rude and mean and, and, and can kind of tear into you and stuff like that. You know, it doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter how they act. That's why it says good and gentle as well. So it's the opposite side of that. You need to be obedient to them too. Even if they're standing there and giving it to you, you take it. You need to be in subjection to them. You need to be in subjection to their authority. You need to recognize their authority. This is Christian character. This is how a man of God is supposed to act and is supposed to be. And you know when someone doesn't want to do that? Do you know what their problem is? Same problem with every other authority. Same problem with why they don't want to obey authority as in government. Same problem with why they don't like to obey God. It's because of pride. Always because of pride, you need to be humble enough to be in subjection to whatever a legitimate authority is in your life. And we allow God to tell us, hey, these are real authorities. You have to have authority if there's any sort of task at hand. There has to be authority and things have to be systematic. There has to be someone who is the lead of what is going on, giving directives. That breaks down even to the point of a family unit. There has to be someone that is in charge when people are working together as a group. And God recognizes legitimate authority and He expects you and commands you as His servant and as a Christian to be in subjection to the authority. You know what it does is it shows the people in the world that you have character. And what it does is it gives them no chance of gainsaying you. And, you know, they can talk crap if they want and, you know, how it is at work and stuff. If you're willing to be obedient and they want to be a punk, they may try to talk crap and, and, and say bad things about you, but they're really the one that looks bad, not you. You're actually showing self-discipline and strength by being in subjection and by being humble and fearing your boss. That's what's actually happening. They're showing that they have no discipline and that they have no character and that they're just out of control in life. That's basically what they're showing. They don't have control over the their own spirit. That's what's happening in their life. So you're actually showing that you have character. And you're putting, it's just like Daniel. You know, they, they weren't able to find anything with him, were they? He had good character. I want you to go with me now to Genesis chapter number 39, verse number 6. So number one, it was obey your boss. <clears throat> number two, it was obeying, when you are obeying your boss, you're obeying God. Number three, we need to obey them from our hearts. It needs to be sincerity. We need to truly be obeying them. Not just in our actions, not just while they're watching us, but in our hearts. Because God sees your heart. And that, much, and that shows you much more you should be obedient to your boss because he wants you to be obedient to him. And he knows whether you're being obedient. If you're not going to be obedient from the heart, from the heart that passage is indicative to me that you're not going to receive rewards. So if you want those rewards, it's not just for eye service, it's for God as well. And He sees the heart and that matters to Him also. So, and then also, the next point was, number, number four, obey the bad bosses too. Obey the bad bosses too. I had you turn to Genesis, right? Genesis chapter number 39. Genesis chapter number 39. When it comes to character, this is extremely important, the most important uh, 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 character trait or virtue that we need to possess as a worker, and it's being faithful. We need to be a faithful person. That means someone that is dependable, a worker that is dependable and trustworthy. Look with me at Genesis chapter number 39, verse number 6. The greatest example of this by far is Joseph in the Bible. Genesis chapter number 39, verse number 6 says this, and he left, that's Joseph's boss, it's Potiphar. And he left all that he hand, had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had. That means anything. He doesn't know about anything that he had. Save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So I want you to notice how faithful Joseph was. That his, bo his boss, Potiphar, was able to give him just complete control of everything. Hey, here's the keys to this. Here's this. You just manage everything. I'm not going to look at the books. I'm not going to look at the inventory. I'm not going to look at the stock. I'm not going to look at the input, the output, nothing. I don't care. The only thing that he was aware of was that Joseph was bringing bread every day. The food that he was eating every day. That's the only thing that he knew. And it says ought. So he didn't know anything that he had. That's what ought means. Nothing that he had. So he trusted Joseph so much that he was willing to allow Joseph just to take care of everything. And Potiphar never even had to look at it. 
Never even looked at it. So it shows you that, that Joseph had proved himself to be a faithful man. A man that was trustworthy. A man that was dependable. Someone that he knew that he could just leave alone and he knew without a shadow of a doubt that the job or the work was going to be done. Look in this uh, same chapter. I want you to look with me at verse number um, 23. Look at verse number 23. <clears throat> same thing happens again. It says in verse number 23, The keeper of the prison... Looked not to anything that was under his hand. Then it goes on and tells you, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So I want you to notice there again, you see the exact same statement. He has two bosses. He's got a boss, Potiphar, who is in high, high authority. And then he's got a boss that's the keeper of the prison. And in both situations, they give to him an extreme amount of authority. In both situations... And in both situations, it tells you specifically that their boss, when they give him the authority, that they trusted him so much that they never even looked at what was getting done and whether or not it was getting done. You know why? Because they knew that it was going to get done. Because they knew the character and how faithful Joseph was. They knew that if they gave something or they gave a job to Joseph, they knew that's going to get done. It's, Joseph was a man that, that their bosses didn't have to sit around and worry about. Joseph was a man that when they entrusted him with, the, when their bosses entrusted him with whatever task, whatever project that it may be, they didn't sit back and concern themselves and, get, and, and worry about, well, you know, this may be a little bit hard for him or, you know, I'm wondering if he's maybe slacking off or did he show up today? Is he, you know, did he decide to take a vacation? Both bosses that Joseph had, they both were willing to just give him everything. Step back, go on vacation. And they knew without a shadow of a doubt that Joseph was going to take care of everything. Doesn't that speak of Joseph's character in a major way? I mean, that shows you that, that that's the kind of guy. You know, if you own a company, if your guy's company gets big, you want to have like 15 Josephs where you can just step back and just allow them. And you just don't have to worry about anything. Because that's one of the biggest headaches when being in management is just trying to find people because almost nobody has character anymore. And you're just hiring and firing people constantly. And you're just always worried about whether or not they're going to do the right thing just because so many people lack character today. So that tells us that, you know, and, and, and if you look around today, you know, in order to be a, a really good employee, you don't even have to go that far. That's, which I'm not saying, hey, do the minimum. I'm just saying there's not a lot of competition out there. You know, you just, you have to do the basics many times because it's, because it's, it's so rare that people do have character today. Joseph was a man of extreme character. He was a man that got the job done. He was dependable. He was trustworthy and he was faithful. So this is point num number five. In order to be a good employee, you need to be faithful. I want you to go with me now to Proverbs the book of Proverbs and specifically chapter 10. Proverbs chapter number 10. Now being faithful it does, it, is, it, it can be kind of broad because it can encompass many different things. He's like, as I mentioned a couple times there, you know, he's a man of character. He, it's a man that's trustworthy and dependable and, and in being trustworthy and dependable that is because you have other character traits. Because you are a hard worker, because you are diligent, right? <clears throat> Primarily, you know, obviously if you're working, there's a lot of things that are important but Hard work is important. Hard work is important. You know, being someone that shows up every day. Consistency. That's important. Being a person that is there every day. Dependable in that sense. Being punctual. Showing up on time. You know, you may have like, a, you know, a, a particular time restraint with something. And you have to be there at a particular time or you're meeting a client. You know, oftentimes there's times where you have to, you know, actually meet a client. Where you have to be there at a specific time. And you're reflecting your boss. You're reflecting your company when you show up late. So you are negatively impacting you know, their view or their perception of how they look at your company and how they look at your boss. When you show that you're late all the time, when you're not punctual, these things matter. So it's Proverbs chapter number 10. Proverbs chapter number 10. I want you to look with me at verse number 26. Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 26. It says this. As vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. Now here when it's talking about sending him, it's sending him of course to do a task. Sending him, you can even think maybe as a messenger or, or more specifically in this context, sending him to do some work. And notice it says, as vinegar to the teeth. And then it goes on and says, and as smoke to the eyes. What is it talking about? It's talking about being bothersome. It's talking about being aggravating or like, 
like a nuisance. You know, it's like when you sit in front of a fire and the, and the smoke is just blowing in your face. It is so aggravating and you just try to move back and forth and try to get away from the smoke. It's extremely annoying, isn't it? That's what it's saying, is that the man that's the sluggard, the man that is, that is you know, the slothful, lazy man, and he's working for you, and you have to send him out like, it's like you got the choice between, you know, John, Joe, and, you know, whatever, you know, AJ, right? This, I'm not, you know, this is not the AJ in the audience here, right? John, Joe, and AJ. Well, you don't have the choice of John and Joe, so it's only AJ. We only got AJ, and you're like, I got to send him to do the task. You know, you're already thinking, oh my gosh. You know, it's aggravating because why? Because you know that he's not going to get the job done. You know some problem's going to come up. Why? Because he's a sluggard. Because he's lazy. I'm not talking about this AJ, right? He's a hard worker, right AJ? <laughs> that's, not, that's not the answer that I wanted. No, I'm just kidding. You know, it's because that man is a sluggard. That's what it comes down to. It comes, it's because that man is a slothful man. A faithful worker is a hard worker. It's someone that you know is going to get the job done. I mean, that's what you're doing is you're working. So if you're saying he's a faithful worker, you're saying he's a hard worker and he's going to get the job done. Well, if you have a man that is a sluggard, that is an unfaithful man because he's not going to work hard and he's not going to get the job done. He is not going to complete the task because why? Because he's a lazy man. And men that are lazy men normally don't have much character in any area of life. That's just a fact. Oftentimes, if you think of people that are lazy, they don't have character in any area of life. They're the same types of people that will lie to you oftentimes. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Go to Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26. We'll actually see this right here. Proverbs chapter number 26. The book of Proverbs is, is, is full. It's just packed full of just so many general truths of life and about how man is and the character of man and how things are in life and experiences of life. I want you to keep that in mind and look at Proverbs chapter number 26, <clears throat> verse number 12. It says this, Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Now what does it mean wise in his own conceit? His own ideas, his own mind, right? He's like, I'm right and you're wrong. You can't tell him like, hey, let me explain this to you, right? That's what that means. It's a prideful man in his own thoughts and his own ideas. Look at verse 13. The slothful man saith, there is a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. <clears throat> so he's just coming up with these excuses, right? The lazy, the slothful, the sluggard man. He's just like, there's a lion outside. I can't go outside because there's a lion outside. You know, it's like a ridiculous excuse. Look at verse 14. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. It's talking about the lazy man when he's sleeping, right? And he's just rolling back and forth. Back and forth. He's laying there and the alarm goes off once. He hits the alarm and rolls over to the other side. The alarm goes off another time. He hits the alarm again. And it's just all day he's just laying there over and over and over again. You can only sleep for so long. Isn't that the truth? I mean, I get that way. When the sun comes up, I can't lay in bed just all day. I can't even take naps during the day. I'm like really bad. Unless I'm sick or something's going on, I'm extremely exhausted. I can't sleep when the light's out. I think I've probably mentioned this before. I can't sleep when the sun is up, out. Or I'll feel depressed because I just, I don't know what it is about my mind, but I just can't take naps. And the reason being is because something in my mind tells me that there are things going on, that there needs to be work that gets done. I think the normal person, if they, when they get a good night's sleep and the sun comes up, they realize it's time to get up. This is the lazy man just trying to stay to sleep. He just so badly just doesn't want to get up out of bed. Just rolling back and forth. Look at verse 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. So notice how that's tied in with that. Just a moment ago when it talked about, seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? What is that talking about? It's talking about a man that you just can't tell anything to. You try to explain to him, hey, it's like this, but he's wise in his own conceit. He's wise in his own mind, in his own thoughts, but he's wrong. Now notice who that man is. It's the sluggard man, isn't it? The sluggard is wise in his own conceit, and it says this, than seven men that can render... A reason. Now, what's the context? It's talking about rendering a reason. It's talking about like him giving excuses. When you back up, what does it say in verse number thirteen again? Right after it talked about the foolish man that gave gave uh, that's wise in his own conceit. The slothful man saith. So this is the man that's wise in his own conceit. The slothful man saith, "There is a lion in the way, 
a lion is in the streets. If you've ever worked with someone on a job site or something that is a lazy person, they're always trying to find ways to get out of work. I'm, I, the guy that I work with right now is just like this all the time. I give him a task and he's every time it seems like he's got some reason why that particular task cannot get done. He doesn't have some drive. He doesn't have some bid. He doesn't have this. He doesn't have that. When he knows he could come ask me for it, he knows that I could give him my keys, he could call me and I'd go get it and bring it to him if we're not together. He's just always, and I'll tell you what he's very, very good at, and he really is, he's extremely good at it, He's good at excuses. He's, he's a professional at making excuses. Do you know what he is? He's wise in his own conceit. That's what he is. I'm constantly having to tell him to, you know, I'll give him a job and he's coming back to me over and over again. Daily, it seems like. Something he's not able to do. You know, it's, it's, you know what happens is you become very good at making excuses. You're wise in your own conceits. It says, the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. So notice that. He's actually good at this, isn't he? He's good at making excuses. He's good at coming up with excuses. When you spend your whole life trying to get out of work, you're eventually going to get good at what? Getting out of work, at coming up with excuses. And oftentimes what these people don't get is that you are, if you spent half the amount of time in actually doing the job as you do trying to get out of the work, you would have been done 30 minutes ago. But they just waste all this time trying to come up with a way of why this particular job just can't get done. Right? And those same types of people like this guy, he'll, he'll, we're, we're in this big, huge building. I hope he's not watching these sermons. We're in this big, huge building and he walks around the building 50 times. 50 times. And he watches his pedometer, his step count, because he's trying to lose weight. And he's got like 12,000 steps. But he's not getting a stinking thing done. It's like, dude. You know, he's, when I give him a task, he's just, he's just so obstinate about not doing that. So he's willing to walk around, but there's something about He's just allergic to work. He's allergic to picking up a hammer or something. That's just how people can be. You know, the, and, and every time, every time I give him a job, there's, he's interested in his own things, but he's not interested in actually doing real hard work. That's what it is. And he'll find whatever excuse that he can come up with. And you know what? His excuses are good, actually. You know why? Because he's become a professional at it over time. When you spend a lot of time making up excuses, you'll eventually get good at it. You need, the Bible contrasts the, the, the faithful man with a sluggard. That's the opposite. That, those are the opposite people. You know what the good, you know, you know what the uh, good boss is looking for? <clears throat> he's looking for a man that's not going to be smoke to the eyes and vinegar to the teeth. He's looking for someone he can depend upon. You know what the opposite of that is? What did it say? The sluggard, Proverbs 10, 26. The sluggard man. That's the unfaithful man. What is an unfaithful man? It's a sluggard. Go to Proverbs uh, 6. Proverbs chapter number 6. Proverbs 13, chapter 13, verse 4 says this. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Another statement I want you to remember. Memorize this, that the opposite of the slothful is diligent. You notice that? It said the soul of the sluggard, slothful, sluggard are the same thing, desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. And what does the word diligent mean? The word diligent, it, it of course means that you're a hard worker, but it's more specific than that. A person that is diligent is a person that is meticulous to attention. They pay close you know, they pay close attention to detail, right? They're meticulous to detail. That's what I meant to say. They, they, they pay very close attention to de detail. If I, my daughter, you know, if I tell her to go clean her room and I want her to be diligent, that means that I want her to be very careful. I want her to work hard at it, right? And I want her to be very careful that she picks up the entire room. So to be diligent is the man that it makes sure that every single aspect of the task that he has been given is finished. That is the diligent man. It is a man that works hard and that he is meticulous to make sure that he completes the whole task. A good, uh, a good rule of thumb, after you've, you've completed a task, you should always go back to that task. This is a way uh, to, to learn the, the virtue or the trait of diligence. Go back to whatever that project is, whatever that job is, whatever you're working on, and look over it one more time and be diligent. You know, be sure that you have completed everything and that from start to finish, from beginning to end, it's done. It's totally complete. So you're in Proverbs 6, correct? Proverbs chapter number 6. Look at verse number 6. Proverbs 6, verse number 6. The Bible says this. 
Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard, when that when wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. I want you to notice what it said in verse number 6. It said in verse 7, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. Now again, notice what's being contrasted here. This is, this is important over and over again. You have the slothful and the sluggard on this side. But you know what you have over here? Of course it's talking about a hard worker because what's the opposite of a slothful and sluggard person? A hard worker. So this person's a hard worker, but you know what else they are? They're a faithful person that can be entrusted with work. Because it specifically points out the fact that they have no guide, overseer, or ruler. Doesn't that sound familiar? What about Joseph was going on? His guide, overseer, and ruler didn't have to guide, overseer, rule, did they? They didn't have to watch him. And what was he? He's the, the epitome. He's the ideal example of a faithful servant. Someone that can be trusted. Someone that can be you know, uh, depended on to make sure they get a job done. The opposite of a, a sluggard, slothful type person is a faithful person. It's a hard worker and it's a man that's going to get the job done. This is how we should be as workers and we should be diligent. We should be diligent workers. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter number 9 verse number 10 says this, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Now notice that. It says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do. That's anything that your hand finds to do. Anything that you lay your hand on or you begin to do. Any task it says you need to do it with your might. What does that mean? You need to do it with all that you have. That means to be diligent. That means to be a hard worker. That means to be attentive and make sure that you get the job done in, entirely from beginning to end. So not only that, that was the, that was the, the, the last point of, of summarizing that section of being a faithful worker is that you need to be a hard worker, but then also you need to be a diligent worker. I'm going to give you another point here. <coughs> Excuse me. You need to be grateful for your job. You need to be grateful for your job. And furthermore, you need to be grateful and content with what you are paid. You need to be grateful with your job and you need to be grateful and content with your wages. Luke chapter number 3 verse number 14 says this, And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely. And then he says this, And be content with your wages. So notice what he told him. He told him to be content with your wages. What is a wage? It's a payment, right? He's saying be content with what you are paid. As a worker, you should be content with how much you make at work. Now, in the United States of America, we have the ability to go look for another job, right? You can go look for another job. There's nothing wrong with that if you feel that you need to make more money, right? There's nothing wrong with that. I've done that at different times in my life. If I'm not able to pay my bills with the amount of money that I'm making right now, there's nothing wrong with trying to go out and look for another job, but until you find that other job, you need to be content with how much you're making still where you're at. There's still a level of contentment. There's still a, a way in which you can be content. And even if you got a few job offers, you should still look at these job offers and say, hey, even if I receive this amount here, which is the lowest amount of wage, I'll be content with that. You still need to have a heart where you are content with whatever you end up with or whatever state that you are in currently at the moment. Philippians 4.11 says this, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. So wherever we're at in life, whatever amount of money we're making, whatever job that you have, whether you're cleaning toilets all day, making $7 an hour, you should be grateful for your job and you should be content for or with your wages. Uh, one other point that's very important, I want you to turn to um, uh, Genesis chapter number 31, verse number 38. Genesis chapter number 31, verse number 38. <clears throat> is to understand that, that, yes, there's a relationship that takes place between the master and the servant, between the employer and the employee. You agree upon you know, what you're paid. You know, they tell you they're going to pay you a certain amount, right? And, and <clears throat> of course, in the sense that the authority go, how the authority goes, there is you know, uh, a boss and a servant. 
But oftentimes, you know, you can request things from, the, from your boss. And they'll give them to you, right? And oftentimes, you know, you can, uh, you know, there's some companies that you can work at where you can just constantly just do whatever you want, right? Which that's not good. There are people that do that is what I'm saying. A person could, you know, if they worked at a company, they could just do whatever they wanted to do. They just, the boss is, the point is that the boss isn't overlooking them. He's not watching them. They're able to just, you know, go out and just do their work however they want to do it, right? Well, there, you know, what, what there are is there's a lot of people that try to take advantage of companies when companies are like that. Or they get put maybe into a position and they'll try to take advantage of companies. And there are a lot of people at, at jobs that have this attitude nowadays where it's just, an all, it's, it's just only taking. They think that it's like a one-way street. It's the same people that aren't obedient to their boss, the same people that don't honor their, their, their supervisors, don't know yes sir, they're arguing, they're talking back constantly. They have you know, no respect for the authority there and they're just constantly taking and they're constantly griping and complaining and murmuring about their company, about their bosses. There's the, there, you know, and that's almost everybody nowadays it seems like. Maybe my company is different than yours, but there's a lot of people that are just discontented all the time. These things go hand in hand. And those types of people are the people that are always just taking. When, you know, when you, there's nothing wrong, as I said, with requesting things from your company. You know, I, I'll request time off, right? They allot you a certain amount of time and you request time off, right? I request this, to not work Sundays. You know, I told them when I, when I was, you know, uh, uh, went in and interviewed that I cannot work Sundays. Like, that wouldn't work if we worked there, right? If I worked at the company, if they tried to make me to work Sundays, I wouldn't be able to do that. That's one thing that I can't bend on because, you know, God is the Lord of Lords, and that's one thing you know that I'm not you know willing to bend on in that particular area. Sundays or Wednesday nights, and I explain that to them. Now that's me taking from the company, isn't it? But you know what? I don't only take. Because of that, I explain to them, you know, very clearly that I'm not the kind of guy that doesn't want to work overtime. Though I'm the kind of guy that I'll work overtime basically any time that you need, and I'm known as the guy at our company that if there's overtime, you know, they come and normally offer it to me first. You know, we're 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 working at as everyone knows Amazon right now, and there's uh, there's always at least three guys there, and what they're doing is there's me, and then there's two other crews of two guys, and what and and what happens throughout the week is. On Monday and Tuesday, it's me and two guys of one crew. Then, on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, it's me and two guys of another crew. So I'm the guy that's doing, you know, the, for, and this is for three weeks, the whole week, right? Of waking up at 3.45 and working from 5 a.m. to 7, and then I have to go to my job site, and I have to be there for eight, sometimes ten hours, oftentimes ten hours as well. So it's a lot of work, it's for a long time. But the point is this, I never told them that I would do that. They just know that I'm the guy that I'm willing to work overtime. I'm willing at my company to bend over backwards. I'm willing when they need me to go out of town every once in a while, I'm willing to do that. If they need me to stay later on a certain night, you know, I'm willing to do that. You know why? Because they give things to me. I'm not going to be this kind of person that's just constantly just trying to purge the company of everything that I can get out of the company and just never do anything for the company. You know, there are a lot of people that do this and let me tell you this, the company pays attention to things like that. Your boss pays attention to stuff like that and he knows the people that are willing to scratch their back too. They know the people that, you know, hey, we're always doing all this kind of stuff for you and you're not doing anything for us. Now, that same guy that I was mentioning a minute ago who works for me, he's like, you know, not in the sense of I'm his employer, but, you know, I'm the boss on the job site and he's my helper. A few weeks ago, he was complaining about that. And I actually went on this big, long rant to him, explaining this concept to him. And, he, and it started with this. He brought up something that our company paid for everyone to go to a baseball game on a Sunday. Now, I couldn't do that because it was a Sunday. And uh, I explained it to him. And he told me specifically, hey, I'll make sure I do something for you and your family, and we'll figure something out that'll be on another day, right? Well, my helper also goes to church and he said, hey, I won't be able to make it that day too. Well, apparently, you know, he got rubbed the wrong way because my boss never said, hey, we'll do something for you and your family. And, and this actually got brought up in context of me telling him that he's worked there for over a year now and he's never worked overtime one time. Not one single time. And I said, in, right now, you're trying to complain to me. You're, you're literally complaining to me about that. 
while you're telling me five minutes ago that you're not working this Saturday. And I said, you think that those two things aren't related? You know why? Because I'm willing to scratch their back. You know what they're willing to do for me? They're willing to scratch my back when I want. They want to make sure if you work for the, it's the same thing about wages. They're just paying you back. They had to buy those tickets. It's just putting money into a, a, an employee that they think is worth it. And if there's a guy that they don't think is worth it, well, then they're not that concerned about giving you more money. They're not that concerned about paying you more, whether it be in the form of a, of a baseball, football game, whether it be in the form of just giving you money on your paycheck. You know, it depends on how you work for them. If you, if you scratch their back, you're willing to bend over backwards for them, they're going to be okay with you not working on Sundays, not working Wednesday nights. If you're willing to go above and beyond in other areas. That's very, very important. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 31, verse number 38. Genesis chapter number 31, verse number 38. This is speaking about uh, Jacob. Let me get there myself. Genesis chapter number 31, verse number 38. And this was my other point. This is going to be the last point. Sometimes as an, as an employee, you need, to, you need to be the one to suffer loss. You need to be the one to suffer loss. Another very good worker, extremely good worker, we're going to read about right now, was Jacob. When Jacob was employed for Laban, he served Laban. Laban was his master and Jacob was his servant. He paid him wages. He legitimately worked for Laban in the same way that you work for your boss. And I want you to look at Jacob when he describes how he was as an employee. It says this in Genesis 31 verse number 38. This twenty years have I been with thee. Thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young. And the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. So he's saying he wasn't going there and, and taking you know, his property and eating his flock, right? And, and then it says they didn't cast their young. He's saying that <coughs> he was able to, to birth them and make sure that there was no complications. They brought forth all of their young. Saying that they didn't die when they came forth. Verse 39. That which was torn of beasts... <coughs> Watch this. I brought not unto thee, I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was, and then notice this, in the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, <clears throat> and my sleep departed from mine eyes. And he's working third shift. Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I serve thee fourteen years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle. And then he says this, And thou hast changed my, way, my wages ten times. Now I don't know if you've ever had a froward boss, but I can guarantee that you've never had a froward boss like Jacob had a froward boss. He changed his wages ten times. Jacob... <clears throat> Is, is having to stay out all day. The drought, he says, consumed him where he doesn't have any water. He's, he, you know, he, he's obviously getting to the point where his health is being harmed in this case. He's, he's freezing all throughout the night. He's losing sleep because he's having to stay up and watch the sheep to make sure they're not attacked. And then not only that, when he's there and his job is to guard the sheep, the sheep are sometimes being attacked by wolves or being attacked by whatever it may be. And he doesn't take it to Laban like, hey, hey, this happened, man. You might want to replace it. You know what he does? He tells him about it, but he requires it of Jacob. He takes it out of Jacob's check, basically. He takes it out of Jacob's pay. You know what? Jacob says that he suffered the loss of it. You know, and, and let me say this. Sometimes at your job, this is the way to get ahead. Sometimes at your job, this is the, the way to be able to advance or to excel. And I'll give you two practical ap applications of this. Those same people and that guy that I was explaining to you about, they always will talk about how they don't want to do work that they are not being paid for. And that's a very similar concept to what's going on right here. He's working, but what's happening? Jacob's not being recompensed for it, is he? That they don't want to do work that they're not being paid for, right? Well, let me just go ahead and tell you this, that if you're not willing to do work that you're not being paid for, you will never get paid to do that work. Because the guy that gets the advances, and I've worked in management almost my whole life, and I know how it works. The guys that they look at to try to move up to a promotion are the guys that stick their neck out for the company. They're the guys that they know that, hey, if I leave him late on a job one day, and that job has to be done at this deadline, he's willing to stay no matter what to get the job done. 
Those are the guys that when it comes time to, hey, we need to promote somebody, this guy quit and we need a foreman, or this guy quit and we need a new manager, they're the guys that are willing to suffer loss. You know what it is? It comes down to this. They're, they're, they are the guys that are willing to sacrifice for the company. And you know what? My company is willing to sacrifice for me a lot. They do a lot for me. And, but even still, even if they didn't, I chose to work there. I'm content with the wages that I have. I'm not only serving them, I'm serving Christ. I'm serving God. So I'm, when I, whatever my hand lays to, I'm going to do it with all my might. I'm going to do it as if knowing that God is watching me. But on top of that and as a bonus, if your company is willing to scratch your back, you know what you need to do? You need to scratch theirs too. There needs to be times, and if you are, and this is advice, if you are looking for getting into management or you are looking for getting into being a supervisor, I'll tell you one of the main things that management looks at is if a person is willing to go above and beyond. If they are willing to suffer loss on their own. If they're willing to maybe work, you know, if you, if you were willing to work a period of time and you, you were doing something that you weren't getting paid for, or maybe they saw you pull your truck up, you're off the clock, and you stayed there for a couple of hours like fixing something or doing something for the company, for the job, you can see this person really cares about their work and cares about our company and wants us to do well. Companies are about, you know, obviously, they want to make money. That's what they're concerned about. And obviously, we don't lay up our treasures on earth. They're, you know, that's not what we're doing. That's not our you know, main goal in life. That's not what we're seeking to do. Obviously, it's good to advance. And obviously, Joseph was blessed when he was advancing in his career. But you know, that's what they want to do. So you know what they're looking at? Is this guy able to make us more money? That's what they're concerned about. And if it's by you working hard, by you sacrificing, by you, you know, being willing to stick out your neck for them every once in a while, that's big in the eyes of the company. Jacob was willing to suffer loss sometimes, and sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you may have to buy something on your dime for the company. Sometimes maybe you may need to go out and get a tool that's going to make your job more efficient. And you'll pay for it yourself so that you can do your job a little bit better. You know why? Because you, be, you need to do things to be well-pleasing, as it says in Titus 2, well-pleasing to your masters. You need to do things right. You need to be a good employee. You need to be a good worker. And we need to serve our employers like we are serving Christ. Now, I want to end with this. This is what we began all of our uh, each uh, episode of the series with. Remember it said that we need to be obedient in all things. But just like with all authority, we always have to keep in mind the Lord of Lords, the God of gods, the King of kings, right? And He is at the top uh, of, the, of the hierarchy, right? He is at the top of the authority structure. Do you know when you don't obey them in all things? Is if they try to get you to do something that would be disobeying to God. Disobeying God's law. If your company, you know, tried to get you to be dishonest, you should tell them no. I am 100% not lying to that person. I am not lying about this. I am not forging this. I am not being disobedient. I, or to, to, to God. Dis, dishonest is what I meant to say. I am not being disobedient to God. That's what's, that, is what our, that is who our true allegiance lies with. That is where our true loyalty is. He is the Lord of Lords and His authority is far above their authority. I would be much more worried and concerned to disobey Him than to disobey some man at my job. Some guy who, at my company who has authority there. If your company tries to get you and to put you in a, an environment or a situation where it's sinful, you know, let's say to go work somewhere that's not right, a gentleman's club or something like that, not happening. Not going there. Not doing it. Right? <clears throat> my brother one time, this is perfect, I'm getting ready to end this, the sermon right now, so I'll tell you a, a funny story. My brother one time, we, we've always done like cabling data and communications, worked for the telephone company, both of us worked together for, for like six years, worked at the same company and everything, saw each other every day. So he was working at the telephone company, <clears throat> he, he had a job one day and he went to, went to a door and he knocked on the door as usual and they didn't answer when he did the pre-call, but he went to the door and he knocked on the door and uh, the door like swung open real quick and the guy walked in the opposite direction real fast. Like where he, behind the door where he wasn't able to see it. That's what I mean by the opposite, opposite direction. So it would be like I open the door on that side and then walk that way. And the guy was like, come in. So he's like, that's weird. So my brother walks in and he's like, hello? And he's like, back here. So my brother like follows the voice like Marco Polo 
walks back there, and there's two stinking queers laying in bed together. My brother's like, call Cincinnati Bell, not doing the job. Walked out. He called up his boss, and he's like, I don't care if you fire me. I don't care what you do, but there's no way I'm going back to that house. Amen. It's not happening. That, and you know why? Because he didn't want to be subjected to that filth. It's disgusting. And obviously, you know, that was a plot to be filthy and disgusting in the first place, which is just disgusting to think about anyways. But the point is this. You shouldn't put yourself in any position. You shouldn't allow your company to put you in any position where you would vex your righteous soul. And if that were the case, you tell them, hey, I'll make this up for you in any other area. I'll do more for you in this other area. I'll do this or I'll do that. I'll work a couple extra hours at this job site. But I'm a Christian and there's no way that I'm sinning against my God by doing that. It's not happening. So there's a Lord of Lords. There's a God of Gods. And when we talk about authority structure, we talk about all that. Hey, there are legitimate authorities in this world. And one of them is our boss at work. And he's our master. We need to be obedient unto him. We need to fear him. Yes, sir. No, sir. We need to work diligently. We need to work hard. We need to serve him like we're serving Christ. We need to be a good worker. But we need to always keep in mind, in the forefront of our brains... I am serving God, number one. I am serving the Lord of Lords, number one. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for giving us all the, the virtues in the Bible, giving us so many good examples of men possessing those virtues and working hard. We thank you so much for the Word of God. We thank you for the hard preaching even in the book of Proverbs where it's calling, the, calling out the sluggard man, the slothful man, even to the point of mockery. And, and, and that should push us to not be that slothful and sluggard man. Help us to be diligent. Help us to be hard workers. Help us to represent our families well, our churches well, and most of all, to represent you well. We thank you so much for everything you've done for us. Dear Lord, help us to have a humble heart and to continue in our lives being obedient to all of the authorities. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.